Good morning. I'd really like to thank the club for the opportunity to spend just a few minutes talking about what we're doing um, at the national level uh, for advocacy as regards the politics that surround uh, medicine and whole, but with particular emphasis on the uh, thoracic surgery. And uh, welcome to my home state. In two years, we'll be, if you see this mountain, we'll be right at the bottom tip of that mountain. That's where it'll be in two years down there in Tucson. And I'm reminded, I grew up here in the valley and my cousins live just up the road here about two or three miles. And I'm reminded with the air show that's going on today about 15 years ago, my cousin was driving up the road just, just north of here. And one of the external fuel tanks of an F-16 fighter fell off the airplane and landed on the hood of the car right in front of him. So as we're out in the lawn today and these planes are flying over, just be looking for the gas tanks falling down. That would make it very exciting. Well, you need to, this is the only slide that you need to know right here. Politicians are like diapers. They both need changing regularly and for the same reason. And uh, if you can't see the politicians there, there's a couple playing solitaire and one's watching the news while their colleague is speaking. But really, these are the realities of Washington. Our system in the United States is designed so that it is very difficult to change. Legislation does produce winners and losers, which makes people uncomfortable. And partisanship really does poison politics. Our democracy really is a special interest democracy, and those special interests that have a voice, i.e. money, at the table are the ones that, get, that are more democratic. And this is a big issue for our societies, is that as physicians, we don't like to compromise. We don't like to compromise on the care that we receive to our, or we give to our patients. We don't like to compromise on what we do as physicians. However, politicians have a completely different world view. They compromise about everything. So the Society of Thoracic Surgeons and the AATS have made a, a advocacy a very important uh, part of what they're trying to do in the future. And so if you haven't been to the advocacy link from the STS website, I'd encourage you to go look at it. In fact, there is a STS AATS workforce on health policy reform and advocacy. In fact, there are some other members of this workforce here in your group today. The outgoing chair is uh, Dr. Bruce Ferguson from North Carolina, who has done a fantastic job and Alan Spears is going to be taking his place. And really what we do is we recommend legislative efforts to the board, and we actually go out and lobby politicians. And I would hope that at the end of this little talk here today that you will also want to join us and help lobby some of your politicians, and we'll talk about some of the impactfulness that that can have and really how simple some of that can be. So let me just give you two quick examples. The first will be important for every physician in the United States, and that's the sustainable growth rate. And we have had substantive engagement with our politicians at the national level for some time now. In fact, we've had substantive and deep uh, interaction with the committees of jurisdiction that oversee the sustainable growth rate, specifically the Senate Finance Committee and the House Energy and Commerce Committee. The former STS President Jeff Rich, who has been very politically active, actually gave testimony to the Energy and Commerce Committee on this. We've actually gone to our congressmen and lobbied for this. And this is very important. The Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee has actually come to the, our political action uh, individuals to actually get the, our comments on what should be in the bill. And in fact, the the, just to put this in perspective is how important this was. The only other real medical group in the room was the American Medical Association, which represents a huge amount of physicians. And so we had almost the same seat at the table as the American Medical Association. So this just demonstrates some of us going out and speaking with some of the members of Congress. In fact, this slide I just updated last night. So just yesterday, the House passed a bill to repeal the sustainable growth rate, the flawed sustainable growth rate. Now, we had actually put, le because of our lobbying efforts, we had the, our leaders at the national level put in language into the bill that would allow registries to access to Medicare data and that 
it would create a way so that registries can become the infrastructure for all of medicine. I haven't been able to find out yet if those are still in the final bill that was passed. The big thing that you'll see on CNN today or Fox News or MSNBC today is that there's still a split, the Democrats versus the Republicans. The Democrats would like to pay for the SGR fix with some monies that the Bush administration had, had set aside for contingencies in Iraq and Afghanistan. In fact, it would be enough money. And the Republicans, of course, playing politics, they say, well, you haven't spent the money and you guys just want to spend all of our money. So there will be this argument. Uh, but that, that should get fixed because this is going to go to a conference committee, which will be behind a closed door. And then all of the politics go away. And that's really where the deals are made. And then this will obviously go to the Senate. And the Senate is much more amenable to passing these bills. And so all of the congressmen agree that this needs to, that this needs to be done and fixed. So this is a real leap forward for all physicians in the United States. And the Society of Thoracic Surgery, AATS Workforce, had a, had a real seat at the table when this legislation was, uh, was drafted. These are data that everyone in this room, I'm sure, are intimately familiar with. However, the screening, the CT scan screening for lung cancer was not going to be uh, covered under Medicaid and Medicare. So what needs to happen at the national level is that the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force has to make the recommendation to Secretary Sebelius of the Health and Human Services in order to, so that this can be paid for at the national level. So their recommendation is crucial. However, nobody really knows how or who the U.S. Preventative Services puts on their task force to make recommendations, and nobody really knows what the timing for their recommendations is. So we went up to the Hill, and we've been lobbying our members of Congress, and we lobbied Secretary Sebelius herself, and our ask was, could you please go to the U.S. Preventative Task Force Service and say to them, we need this, we, you need to decide what you're going to do with this. In fact, Dr. Wood actually went to a congressional briefing where he told the legislators why this would be important. And we did have success with this. So on the last day of last year, the U.S. Preventative Task Force actually came out with their screening guidelines, which you'll see here. It was important that it happened last year because by law, within two years, it has to be affected into action, which means that if we had waited till 2014, this wouldn't have to roll in until 2016. This is also important because now, by law, Medicaid, or sorry, Medicare will actually have to do a national coverage analysis uh, and find out exactly who's going who's gonna to benefit from this. And we believe that when they do this coverage analysis, they will actually be able to see how impactful lung cancer is and then hopefully get us more research dollars. Because, for example, lung cancer research, NIH-funded lung cancer research is about one-fifth that for, uh, for uh, breast cancer research, although the amount of deaths by breast cancer is about fourfold with lung cancer. So we met in January as our workforce, and these are our current legislative uh, priorities for the incoming year. Again, payment reform, we've had this as one of our priorities for the last several years, and it continues to be important because we want to see this all the way out until its, uh, uh, its final um, terminal bill. Also, access to the Social Security Death Master file. The STS database has given us an enormous stick up on Capitol Hill. We are one of the few medical specialties that has a robust database, and our database from all databases is probably the best. However, starting in November of 2011, we no longer have access to the Social Security Death Master file. So we don't know if our patients that we put into the database are dead or alive. And so it's very difficult for us to follow outcomes. And so we're working to re get re-access to this Death Master file. Also, we're, lo we're working on liability reform. There will be a there is, are indications of a work shortage, shortage, not only for cardiothoracic surgery, but for all of medicine. And then finally, we're very excited about starting to engage our, um, our colleagues around the country and our legislators about health care disparities. That is, what about underserved minorities when it comes to access for things like lung cancer screening or coronary artery eval uh, evaluation? So on a daily basis, our group that it lives and works in Washington, D.C., they monitor these bills. These are just some of the bills that are working their way through the various houses of Congress, 
and we're trying to give as much input so that we have a seat at the table because the the idea in Washington DC is if you don't have a seat at the table you are being eaten as a meal so we're trying to be get ourselves a seat at the table how can you get involved one way is to donate to the pack I'll talk about that more in a little bit also we have uh, an, at least annually sometimes semi-annually a fly-in where what you'll do is, is you'll say that you're coming into our fly-in to our, our PAC folks there in Washington, D.C., and then they will try to organize um, a meeting with you and your local congressman or your congressman's staffer. And, um, and those are very, very effective because the congressmen want to meet their constituents because you live where, they, where they're from. Also, hosting a tour. Call your local uh, congressman or congresswoman and have them come to your facility tour your hospital, tour your research labs, let them, let them meet who your personnel are. This has also been very, very effective. I have some key contact forms. These key contact forms in, would be so that if you'll fill them out, I'll be able to take them back to our personnel in DC so that if you, they know that your congressman or congresswoman has an important bill or something coming up, they can contact you so you can send them an email. This was very helpful for our local legislators because, for example, I could have them call me on the phone and they could say, now what exactly does this mean? And what exactly do physicians want? And believe it or not, your congressman will hear from you, especially if you're at an academic medical institution or if you're at a robust private practice and you're a physician. And then finally, if you personally don't feel interested in becoming politically active, perhaps support your colleague that does. So if your colleague wants to go to a fly-in, maybe allow them to have the time so that they can do that. This is just, uh, just so you get an idea of where our pack stacks up. My brother-in-law is an orthopedic surgeon up in Mesa, and he's very pr I talked to him last night about this, and he's very politically active, and he was very happy that the orthopedic surgeons are outpacing the thoracic surgeons. But um, I'm not even going to, I can't even show you how much the trial lawyers put on their pack, because then all the other medical packs would be way down here, but it's about six million a year. So this is, for example, what some of our, what some of our members have done, where they've taken members of their, of their congressional uh, districts, and, or their representative from their congressional districts or their state, and they've brought them to their institution to take a tour so they can see what the research dollars are doing, so they can see what infrastructure dollars are doing, so they can see what, um, when they um, have, uh, they see residents, so they know that when they pay, when the federal government pays for residents, what kind of quality they're getting. We do have allies in Congress. So both uh, representatives Bustani and Bouchon, they're both cardiothoracic surgeons um, that have, uh, for one reason or another, not been able to practice anymore. Um, so for example, uh, uh, Chuck Bustani, he developed some degenerative arthritis in his neck, so he, uh, that's why he can't operate anymore. He can't wear his loops and put his head down for a long period of time. But, so we do have representatives in Congress, and we support them, and they support us. There is an actual docs caucus there are about 15 um, doctors in Congress right now, and it's led by an OBGYN from Texas. So how do you gain, most people see that the congressmen are in Washington, and I, I can't call them, they're very, very busy. And that's, that might be true for senators, because you only have two per state. But what about your representative for your legislative district? A district is about 600,000 people in the current United States. Well, 25% of the, this is adult population. 25% of your adult population can't vote. They're felons or for, they just moved into the district and they, for whatever reason, they cannot vote. An additional 27% just don't register. That's almost half of your district just cannot or will not vote. And then 36% of those that can vote don't vote. So now we're, our, our pool is already shrinking down even more. Of the remainder that can vote, 50% are going to vote for the other guy. And that says that then 50% of the remainder is for our guy. And only about half of those people that are going to vote for our guy give money to our guy. And just at the very little top of the pyramid, give both their money and their time to that guy. And there's only about 1,500 people in the legislative district that do that. So out of 600,000 people, it's only about 1,500 people that the congressman really gets feedback and information and money from. 
So it doesn't take a lot of money to have a face-to-face -face time or a lot of influence with your congressman. And as physicians, we automatically have a little bit extra clout with that congressman. So it doesn't take, it for the Senate, it can take a lot. But for your local congressman, it does not take a lot to, for you to become on a one-on-one -on -one basis with your congressman. And the, important, the reason why that's important is because if you develop a rapport with your congressman, then when your congressman has a question about a bill, they'll call you. And that's what you want. You want them to call you and solicit your advice. Or if there's a bill that's coming up and you're one of our key contacts, they'll, when you call your congressman, they will put you through to your congressman. So what's next for you? I hope that you will contribute to our pact. I know there was, uh, the STS is 50 years old this year and we were trying to go for a $50 for 50 years campaign. So please uh, donate to the pact. You can go to the website or you can call our DC office through the advocacy, um, through the advocacy web page. I've got some key contact forms that I'll pass out right at, uh, right at the end of the session here. And if you, um, I only got a few of them, but please you can go onto our website and you can get to become a key contact. And then finally, um, every month, there's an advocacy journal that comes out. There's an STS PAC update that'll come out or, or emailed to you. And of course, on the web, I showed you the, the link to the advocacy site. So in summary, I hope I've been able to show you that the STS AATS, that we have been very politically active and we have had very impressive wins. Really, the congressmen that you'll meet, both on the Senate side and the House side, they want to help you. That's how they get reelected, and more importantly, that's how they get your money. They want to help you, but what they really want is political cover, so that if they make a decision that the other guy could be negative about, they can say, well, you know, these, it was good for these doctors. You can make a difference. We have made a difference at the national level, and you can make a difference with your legislator for your area. But please know that this can be a very frustrating process. All you have to do is watch CNN to know how frustrating this can be. I really appreciate your time, and uh, I can't wait to see you in two more years when you come back to, to Tucson. Thank you very much.